Welcome, everybody. Um, we're here today to tell you a story about how we, <laughs> how we have changed the Norwegian health uh, sector. And uh, before we start, uh, start with an, an explana explanation. If you want to do a talk at the conference, you need a catchy title. <laughs> That's how we start. You, uh, if you do something boring like uh, security in the health sector, they won't accept you. But if you do something catchy, then, then you're in. But what does geriatric mean? Geriatric means that something is old, outdated, outmoded, uh, what, do you call, what do you call it? And in our case, we're going to tell you a story about a geriatric health sector filled by old software that don't want to change. They want to stay the way they are. Thank you. But before, before that, let's do our introductions. All right. All right. Um, hi. Um, a bit about us. We are from a small company called Udelt, in, uh, located in Trondheim, with a sub company in Oslo. We are four people <laughs> uh, and Rune and uh, Steiner at Tidea. Uh, established in 2013, do uh, identity, digital identity, do data sharing, and uh, of course everything in the middle, web security, etc. And dabbles in building trust models and uh, like. My name is Dag. Uh, I'm old, so <laughs> <laughs> I grew old. up uh, with the my first computer was a Commodore 64, transition to the Amiga, started developing uh, at age of uh, 13, uh, went professional at the age of 20, 21. So I've been doing this professionally for 30 years now and uh, been doing mainly security the f last five years. Uh, developer, still developing. Uh, a lot more talking today and coding, unfortunately, <laughs> um, but uh, having fun all the time. Games a lot, read science fiction, fantasy, do yoga, uh, and uh, take care of my family, mainly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rune. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rune. I'm, a, I'm not as old as he is. <laughs> That's my feedback. But actually, I've been programming since before him. I started with the uh, did any of you have an old computer called at, at the Tandy Color Computer? Oh, uh, this was early in the 80s, and I've been programming since then. So I'm a developer, but uh, the type of social nerd, you know, I love computers, uh, anything that goes on electricity, basically. Yeah, but I end up talking a lot. And in my spare time, I got two greenhouses. Uh, and uh, yeah, family, you know, you know the stuff. But let's not, <laughs> we can talk all day about ourselves, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about the Norwegian health sector. And uh, when tell, uh, talking about, uh, to start our talk, we need uh, you all to be on some background. I'm guessing most of you are Norwegians, but maybe not everybody. So, Norway. <laughs> Norway is. Not the capital of Sweden, of course. I hope you all know that. We're about five million people. Uh, in, uh, so we're a small country, but we're, we're a big country geographically. We're spread out, uh, so quite thin. And in our history, uh, since we've been many small societies, we're used to handle our own. The, each little village do their own thing. Uh, manage on their own, and this is important because that means that uh, each and every place um, they have this strong sense of doing their own thing. On top of that, uh, Norway, we are the best country to live in the world, okay, according to the UN, and a good country means a good healthcare system. So we have very high expectations as well. And of course, you know, oil, that's how we can pay for this. This means that uh, the Norwegian health sector, there are, since health care is free in Norway, and uh, we aim to be the best in the world, 
it, it has some uh, consequences for how we work. Uh, the Norwegian health sector is primarily divided into four, region, four regions. Each of those regions are their own separate uh, organization, and they, they cooperate, that's not, uh, but they are completely separate, distinct uh, organizations. And uh, th this is part of our history. We are used to doing our own thing, and we do that in healthcare as well. On top of that, we're not only four, four regions. We have primary health care, where each municipality uh, do their own thing. And we have uh, hundreds of municipalities. We have thousands of doctor's offices. And again, each and every one of them are their own organization doing their own thing. On top of, on top of this, we have the national, national providers, the one we are working for, the Norwegian Health Network. They are our customer. Norsk Helsenet. Norsk Helsenet, yeah. And we have uh, several other large organizations that uh, offer common uh, software for the health, uh, the Norwegian health sector. And, and this means that we have a huge number, and I mean a huge number of uh, different uh, software systems around. Uh, around. Each and, uh, since each and every doctor's office can choose whatever they want, we have hundreds of suppliers working on uh, everything from modern web applications, who we love, of course, back to my, almost old to my, back to my old Tandy. <laughs> the, it's a huge spread of uh, software systems, and that is much of our challenge. So, um, a bit of history. Oops. Oops, here we go. Uh, before 2012 in Norway, by law, it was not allowed to share health information by dig digital means. It was not allowed. What happened was that every organization built a firewall around their organization, closed down all communication. Do you see me? Into the light. Into the light. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit scary. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the security system, they closed off in, uh, access to the internet. So everything was closed off, no access whatsoever. Then, in 2012, uh, there came a storting uh, melding, message to the parliament, number nine, where everything was turned around. From not being allowed to share uh, health information, you were required to share health information with systems where a patient were treated, where that information was needed. You were required to do so. Not an easy task, of course. So what started happening was, of course, um, we had all these uh, organizations which we talked about, the regions for them. We had some national services at that time e-prescription -prescri e and channel were on its way. We had all the municipalities, 300 plus of them, a lot of private actors. And then they, these actors were going to share information. How did they do that? Well, of course, they did it on demand, point by point, integration by integration. Every time they did it, they had to start uh, from scratch, Point one, uh, who are the users? Really difficult here because all the users were local to the organizations. They had to decide on how they wanted to identify systems, organizations. They had to uh, uh, enter contracts for doing it. And they had to decide how they were going to secure the integrations. Every time they did it, starting from scratch, again and again and again and again. So. Chaos, of course. This is uh, not scalable, uh, scalable, scalable at all. So uh, something had to happen. Uh, so there was a process. Uh, people got together, talked, discussed. Uh, director to e Health, uh, a lot of other actors from the regions, uh, and. They, um, 
determined certain requirements. They needed to be able to tell an API which person is requiring health information right now, which health personnel, which organization wants some data, and they needed to find a common way to secure the integrations. So in 2018, a central service was introduced called Helsida. This consisted of first, in Norway, we are really lucky because we have a national ID. Each person in Norway has a unique ID, Fødselsnummer, and we have some existing, uh, existing EID schemes, ways of securely identifying persons, Bankile, of course, which everybody knows. Uh, we have Bypass, Commercial Actor, and Confields. So we build a service where we have integration to these national EIDs, and also we build integration to all the actors, all the systems, where we can, where the, they can, of course, use the service to identify persons. Uh, they can use the integration to in uh, identify organizations on different, different levels, and the APIs can use the service. So, something like this, but how to build it? What technology do we use? At, at the time, there were, were some, um, some alternatives. Did uh, any of you attend the Dominic Bayer talk today? Yes. yes. You got some history there. Uh, but at the time, we uh, made the decision, uh, point one, no discussion. We were going for some standardized protocols, of course. And the uh, whole hottest potatoes were OAuth and OpenID Connect. So, Helsida is uh, basically an OpenID uh, Connect provider and uh, OAuth 2 uh, authorization server. It's built on this product called the Identity Server at the time. Now it's called uh, Duende Identity Server by uh, Dominic Byer and uh, Brock Allen friends of ours, excellent people, and of course a lot of stuff on the top to provide the functionality we need. Uh, I won't go into the technical details of the protocol or anything. Basically, Helsida is a, a service which is integrated with all the different EID providers in Norway, uh, in, dash, in addition to Edeporten which most people know, I ex ex expect, another uh, ID portal. Also, we have integration with the regional EIDs. We're building on that, working on that. Uh, also, we are using um, the applications are integrating with us uh, using mainly two uh, different endpoints at our service. First, we have an endpoint for user authorization, authentication. Not authorization, authentication. Uh, an important point is that this endpoint requires the use of a browser. That's a really important point because you need a UI to log on a user. Also, we have an endpoint to provide the credentials needed, point one, to prove to the application that the user was logged in and who he is. Second, to get access to the APIs tokens, basically. JOTS, signed Java to uh, web tokens. So, uh, when we had kind of designed the system, how, uh, there were, was a lot of challenges building it. But the first challenge, of course, was getting APIs aboard. Uh, without APIs, we were of no value whatsoever. Uh, there were some uh, existing APIs in Norway at that point. Uh, you had the e-prescription and we had the core health journal, Kjernjournal, which maybe some people have heard about. Uh, Kjernjournal is um, an EHR, a journal system, which is national, contains a small amount of critical information, health information about all people living in Norway. For example, if you are allergic to some medicine uh, and you, 
at some point you get sick, you get uh, driven, to, uh, you get, uh, you have to go to the hospital, like you know, getting an operation, for example. And the doctor needs to know if you are allergic to some of the medicines you have to use. Uh, at that point, uh, there's a great chance that the hospital wants it on this information. So the doctor has to ask you. You might not be able to tell him, or maybe not remember. That is the purpose of Chernobyl. We have one central place where such uh, critical information can be stored. Uh, at the time, uh, Chernobyl had built their own security mechanisms. They had their own integrations to national IDs. Uh, we went and talked to them. There was a lot of discussions. Uh, they saw that we were going to provide some of the stuff they had built themselves. The stuff they had built was not really their core business. That was not their main function. So they saw the value in using HealthSida. Also, we could provide some functionality they really didn't want to build themselves. So we agreed on a strategy to migrate Chanchenal to HealthSida. Uh, <laughs> and we are still working on that. Uh, it's going... <laughs> Things move slowly. Uh, Helsinki is used to large extent within the municipalities today, and uh, we are slowly migrating older systems. Uh, for new APIs, uh, I should change the slide. Really, um, we spoke with several actors. Uh, for example, we talked to the Norwegian Institute of Public Health at the time, a lot, uh, FOE, which most people know nowadays. Uh, we got them on board to provide uh, an API for, at the time, they were dig uh, working on digitalization of what you call dødsmelding. Uh, when a person dies in Norway, you have to fill out the schemes and deliver to, to the tax department to Folkehelse Institute, uh, to various actors. Uh, it was uh, done by paper at the time, so we were working on making a digital version of it. And we got the uh, Folkehelse Institute on board to use HealthSida to protect their APIs, to provide uh, so systems can send messages about people dying to them. It's a, it's a bit sad talking about it, I feel. <laughs> uh, so, the big win was that when the pandemic hit, uh, Folkets Institute was already prepared. They were using Healthy there, the new Healthy there as an API. So it was decided when uh, they saw the need to provide nationally, you had to provide Folkets Institute with information about vaccinations and test results, etc. So they decided we are going to build APIs, we're going to use Helsida and all the various actors, all the vendors of applications around Norway, which provide functionality around it, we're going to integrate with Helsida. Uh, did that, and it was a great success. Uh, some applications were built in weeks uh, because we use standardized protocols. We can use existing libraries, it's not a lot of code, and it's well known how to do it. I have to say the slogan there, communication, persistence, and patience. I really like that one. That's how we sold it. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Then, uh, so APIs. The, uh, so at, at this moment in our history, we have uh, several APIs protected by our service. These are national APIs that uh, anyone who has the right to use it can use it. But an API it itself has no value without someone to use it. And in our health sector, we have lots of, <laughs> what I like to call painfully ge geriatric, very old uh, EHR. An EHR is an electronic health record. It's where the health personnel store all the, the simply said, uh, all the information about their patients. Each, uh, everyone who offers healthcare in uh, Norway are bound by law. They must have one of these. And uh, so everyone has, has bought one. Everyone has uh, at least one of those installed. And due to the way we are fragmented in Norway, we have lots and lots and lots of these again. 
And that means that there is so much outdated technology out there. We have most of those systems, they, they are built on uh, desktop technologies, locally installed on every doc doctor's office, and there is very much complexity in these systems. The, these aren't easy to build. And all this complexity means that change goes very, very slowly. The, and the vendors, they don't want to change. And the customers, they don't want to buy new, new stuff. So it means that the entire health sector really wasn't willing or interested in taking risks at all. And you, know, you saw this figure. And uh, as you now know, we have to introduce a web browser. And how do we do that? Combining this web technology with all those uh, desktop applications. The <laughs> we, try, we try to glue together two completely different paradigms and <laughs> with good, uh, good intentions, really. Because to use OpenID Connect, and which is the protocol that we are based on, you must, as in must, use a web browser. There is no way. We have uh, seen someone trying to avoid the web browser and it doesn't work. You must do the web browser to do this. And so, so we have to combine this web browser somehow with the existing application, the, this uh, desktop uh, software. You know this stuff. Most of them run probably Windows XP or something like that. It's built on Windows forms back in the early 2000s, and they haven't changed since then. But they have, now they have to in include a web browser into their application. So uh, I'll show you the two, the two ways this can be done, because uh, we've spent a lot of time on this. The first way is to integrate the web browser itself into the desktop application. In this way, you use a, a, a browser component. Many, many organizations have used Internet Explorer, you know, the, but you have options for Edge, Chromium, and so on. So they, in, but anyhow, they integra integrate the web browser into the application. This gives uh, the application vendor full control of the web browser, and they can. So when the user needs to log on, they display the browser window, tell it go to the Health City logon page, and the web browser takes over. It runs the OpenID. Uh, OpenID Connect uh, protocol. It goes to our, for those of you who saw Dominic's talk, uh, you know the authorized endpoint. And it will display this web UI. In our application, you can choose, I want to log on using a smart card or bank ID or whatever. And when you are done, uh, the desktop application will observe this web browser because they have full control of it and pick up the callback. When the user is done logging on, the, our, our service uh, will do a callback to a known URL, and the desktop application can sniff at this, pick up uh, the information it needs, and it can com conclude the, uh, the protocol flow using either the application itself or its own backend. So this means that we combine the web frontend with, with the backend and uh, thereby you still have your desktop application, but you do a logon in the browser. If you don't want to do this, there, there is one more option, and that is to uh, call the web browser on the operating system of, of the user. This can be done doing uh, traditional, you just tell the operating system, open this URL, and the web browser on the desktop will handle everything. And then um, either inside your application you have this URL scheme, go back to my application using a very special URL that is registered in the operating system. Or we do a hack where you actually run a small web browser inside the application. It sounds like a horrible security hole, but this is running locally on your computer, so it's okay. <laughs> and you're laughing, but, yeah, but it works. And uh, since the web browser itself, it's, it's good, as long as you use a modern web browser component, so it's safe. And when you come back, you're at, uh, at your local computer, and whatever happens there, 
stays there. Uh, and these are basically two, the two ways. And you, <laughs> but you can imagine explaining this to each and every uh, EHR vendor. <laughs> it takes time. It can be, oh, it can be exhausting. <laughs> so, but I w uh, just have to say that while it sounds like this is like a dark and uh, not very happy path, not everything is bad. <laughs> Yay! We need a happy slide. Because what we see, there are many web-based applications on the way, and the entire market, uh, the entire health sector is moving. And this is like a snowball that's growing, it's getting traction, and it's moving faster and faster. And the entire sector is, is moving from uh, using this old system, the thick clients, all that, over to web applications built with um, OpenID Connect and Warp to as the fundamental. And that, that makes so much more sense. So, <laughs> while there are many interesting challenges, everything isn't bad. I just have to say that. But Doug, of course, it's not that easy either. It is not. Um, so we are building a national service, which is uh, basically going to be used by all health personnel in Norway all EHR systems in Norway, uh, other applications used for treating, used by health personnel. We are basically going to protect most of the national, if not all, national APIs providing health information about persons in Norway and other APIs. So, of course, this poses some unique challenges. Uh, we are in a sector which is driven by a lot of laws and regulations. Everybody knows GDPR, of course, which is a difficult issue in itself. I uh, suspect a lot of you have met uh, challenges around that uh, as an architect or designer or developer. You can design your perfect product. It provides all the new, all to satisfy all the requirements your user have all the business requirements, and it's perfect, it's solid, it's performant, it scales, everything. And then some beep uh, legal persons could come and say that, uh-uh, that's not allowed, you can't do that. So you have to rebuild. So uh, this happened, of course, a lot some years ago. You no know, people have really GDPR in their mind when they build systems, so it's privacy first. You have to take account into the, law, uh, the laws into account. In health, we have a lot of other laws than the GDPR, uh, which regulate how we build systems. And that's a large, a big challenge. We have to involve legal persons uh, early in the process. It really decides upon a, 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 a big, it's a, it's a, it's a large uh, factor when we uh, create our architecture and how we, where we store our data, what the data we can store, what we have to fetch from other places, what information we can log, how, uh, for how long time we can log it, what do we do with the... Uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot of really challenging uh, issues. Uh, also, what is a bit of a challenge, uh, something we have experienced during the years, is that when two worlds collide, that's the legal sector and the technology sector and you get people who <laughs> have to talk to each other and you have your own language you know your tribe language and you use the same words which means different things a lot can go really wrong in the discussions you can really really end up believing that you understand each other but don't which can have large implications later on in the process it's difficult, and it's a, it is fun. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me or not. <laughs> After a while, it gets, gets fun. Uh, also, Helsida uh, is basically a startup. Uh, we have uh, been doing this for some years now, but uh, we are just now getting the snowball rolling. We did do some mistakes early on. We did, uh, there are uh, movements uh, security-wise 
where we have to change things, where we have to provide new functionality. We can do that quite fast, but uh, the problem is that the systems using us is not built like that. Uh, by, uh, because of various reasons. Uh, and the systems are critical for treating people, treating patients. Some systems are, uh, are built uh, by third-party vendors, uh, international third-party vendors. Uh, some uh, systems are built uh, based on a yearly budget, and then you don't have any large budget anymore. Some systems are locally deployed, and they have a really complex deployment, so it takes a lot of time to roll out new versions. So when we introduce changes, we can't do it quickly. We have to be backward comfortable for a long time, and if you do introduce breaking changes, we can't introduce them before we have to have several years of lead time in some cases. So that's a bit of a challenge. We have to move slowly when we want to move quickly. <laughs> uh, also, we do have to put a lot of thought when we build new stuff. Because when we have launched the new stuff and it's getting used, we are locked in for a long time with that stuff. Uh, also, yeah, I won't go into that. Finally, uh, we have touched upon this, but uh, HealthCD can't be unavailable. Uh, when a system is dependent on HealthCD for either just functioning, in some cases, that's, they, they're dependent on uh, HealthCD for just logging on users, or they pr uh, are dependent on HealthCD for pro getting critical information in a treatment uh, situation, uh, we can't be available anymore. It's a life and death thing. So uh, we are, yeah, I think Rune will get into this now, but we are uh, thinking a lot about how do we stay available all the time and perform as we should. Oh. Yeah. Um, Doug presented, uh, explained, we have been like a startup. We haven't gone on for, we haven't been doing this for so many years. We went into production in 2018, and uh, of course, we're still, still learning. But uh, we have started getting some serious traction. We are now used by most, if not all, the national e-health services in Norway. All the national APIs, everyone, they are using us uh, to do their access control, user logon, and, and that stuff. That means that, uh, but that doesn't mean we, we are done. We are, uh, we are growing and we see a lot of change coming, but al already we are seeing about uh, 1 million tokens, security tickets, uh, 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 that we create every week. About 100,000 people do logons using our service, service and we have more than 500 uh, different clients, software systems that are using HealthCity in our production environment. That's not bad, I think. And we have a thousand, more than a thousand in our test environment. So there's lots of stuff coming. Uh, we are early adopters for several of the protocol extensions. That's part of uh, what Dublin didn't want to talk, uh, talk about in his talk because it was the basic stuff. But we are, we are, we have some, uh, due to the legal requirements, we have to have uh, high trust to the systems who use uh, HealthCD. And that means that uh, we are learning by the finals, uh, finance sector, act actually, how they secure their systems. They're also using the same protocols that we are. And uh, we are using uh, several fairly new protocol me mechanisms to secure uh, to secure the systems that use HealthCD. And uh, so, so we are growing quickly, and we expect uh, very much new stuff coming next year. Uh, <laughs> we come back next year and talk about that, I think. <laughs> so, and uh, at the same time, uh, as a startup, we have uh, experienced severe growing pains. The, we, uh, for a long time, we were like three guys. <laughs> hacking on our computers, doing everything from 
support to counseling to programming. We did everything. We have grown, but still we are a fairly small team supporting lots of uh, services. And we see that uh, our, our software, there are far too many manual processes. Getting started with Health Data, it's a, a manual registration for doing testing. Going to production, it's a manual step. And so we are, this is things we are working on. Uh, we have to get better. And uh, at the same time, since uh, so many new systems uh, uh, starting to use Health Data, we see that uh, they have new requirements and we have to adapt, we have to support uh, these new systems. And uh, that means that we have to deliver fast while being careful. And <laughs> on top of, top of this, I'm guessing a lot, many of you can guess, our documentation is not good enough. <laughs> of course, of course. But so, where are we going? To the stars and beyond. <laughs> and now, we are aiming to start automating. We, are, we have a separate team at the Norwegian Health Network that are building a self-service system for Health City. That means that uh, soon we have, uh, we'll have a fully automated onboarding process, both for testing environment and our production environment. That's going to be great. We're going we're gonna to save so much time. It's, oh. <laughs> On top of that, we have some extremely critical systems that are going to use Helsida. The Norwegian, uh, uh, it's the same as the 9-11. No, no, not the 9 uh, what do you call it? 9-11? Yeah, 9-11, yeah. 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 yeah, the emergency services. The one who send the uh, ambulance when you get sick and all that. They are going to trust uh, Helsida. And we don't want them to stop just because we deployed to production some stupid bug. So we, we have to go for at least a 99.9% uh, availability on Health Data. And how to do that? <laughs> That's a topic in itself. We don't have time to talk about that. On top of that, we need to increase our performance. We need to increase our reliability. So we are working on uh, not being dependent on external services. So it means that we have some requirements, some external services that uh, we have requirements to. For instance, when a user log on, we look up um, in, the, uh, in the national people registry to see who, who they are. What's your name? We look up in the health personnel registry. Is this person has uh, health personnel and so on. So we have some external dependencies. And uh, uh, right now, if they go down, we, we, we won't stop, but we don't know if a person is a health personnel, and uh, that's a legal requirement for many of the systems who use Health Data. So we, we are working on not having these hard uh, dependencies on those uh, external systems. And uh, even further, we can't go down even uh, when, our, uh, uh, when the environment around us are going down. For instance, if our database goes down, we can't stop. If uh, the DNS goes down, we can't stop. If someone uh, digs and cuts the cable to our data center, we can't go down. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is solved by redundancy, of course, and that's uh, things we are working on. Uh, further, we are working on enhancing the security of Helsida. One of the greatest risks uh, when using uh, uh, OAuth. We are issuing tokens. This proves that the system we're talking to, uh, an API, it represents uh, an organization, a person, and so on. If someone steals that token, then they can impersonate that person, that system, that organization. We want to avoid that. So we are looking at introducing mechanisms that uh, guarantee more or less that uh, whoever calls an API is is the right owner of that token. It's done, there are two mechanisms we're looking at. One is the demonstrated proof of possession, DPOP, and the other is the mutual TLS. There are two very interesting mechanisms, and the finance sector are already building systems that are using these. We are looking into how to support mobile applications, of course. How do we use mobile applications in the health sector? We don't know. But uh, we are looking into it. 
how do healthcare personnel use mobile devices? And how do we secure them properly? And of course, we are <laughs> trying to improve our documentation. That's his job. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, and, uh, but one thing we are quite good at, and we are going to be even better, is uh, sample code. We have uh, lots of samples that show how to use the various mechanisms we offer. And uh, we are going to keep improving that, because we see that uh, uh, written documentation is nice. A running sample that shows how things work, it's invaluable. That's where the value is. So as you see, we have lots to do in the years to come. We are... Uh, yeah, lots of time yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about this all the day, but uh, let's wrap up. It's late. It's the first time we're doing this talk, so we are not... What do you call it? Whoa, uh, oh, 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we've been doing this for some years now, and we have learned a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff. I will uh, summarize some of the points. Uh, the main point, the most most significant, uh, significant single thing when building a service like we do is creating trust. Uh, you are in, in it for the long term and uh, the customers using you are really relying on you. So how do you create trust? Um, uh, in our experience communication is really essential. Uh, at the beginning, small scale, uh, we spoke with everybody, person to person. Uh, we had meetings, we used Slack, of course, we used uh, all collaboration tools available, and we got to new, know people. We didn't only talk to organizations, we talked to people, the people doing the stuff. And we talked and talked and talked and talked, and I worked out. <laughs> uh, because I believe we had a sound idea. Uh, of course, that doesn't scale when you grow. You can't speak with everybody when you have thousands and thousands of customers. So then, documentation, as Rune said. We are working on the documentation. Uh, it grows better and better. Documentation is difficult to maintain. Uh, it's challenging, but we are putting a lot of effort into it, or are going to put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Uh, Sample code, of course, treat your sample code with tender care. It's going to be copy-pasted everywhere, so uh, keep it up to date. Put a lot of effort in it. Uh, comment a lot. Uh, if you don't want it to be copy-pasted, be really explicit about it. Uh, right now, we are mainly a .NET uh, C Sharp shop, but uh, we serve customers doing all kinds of languages have examples in all kinds of languages. Uh, we are not that good at that yet, but we are working on that too. Uh, let me scroll down here. Yeah, uh, I shall ma mention that. Uh, we are working on, and this is uh, XP Gain, wor working on building a common trust model for the national health sector. Uh, which is extremely challenging and really fun. And it's really important when you are going, uh, getting into the data sharing bit at the national level or a sector level. Uh, there are going to be some talks about that at NDC Security. So look that up. It's a large topic. Uh, another thing uh, we have learned, a lot of XP gained for... Uh, we are really, really good, getting good at the protocols. Well, we did say uh, we are getting we know them very well now because it has been a success we have been lucky in a way because when we introduced the protocols they were kind of immature yet but uh, us especially the finance sector got on board they have been doing new stuff which are making them more and more tight more and more secure more and more advanced for enterprise use cases mm. Uh, yeah, but I just have to reiterate uh, feedback. <laughs> this is so fun. The, 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 the trusting, it's personal. 
the uh, people don't trust organizations they trust people and this uh, this personal meeting people talking to them uh, explaining what's going on it's been really important uh, for health city to get traction and uh, so if you, if you are a startup, if you are building something, you want uh, to get uh, people to use whatever you're building, know your stuff and talk to your customers. I think that's the most important I thing we learned. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So, 40 minutes uh, left. So uh, lots of time to for questions. Uh, but thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. So just grab hold of us if you want to talk with us. You know? A question? Yes? Yeah, we are taking questions. Let's start here. Um, what's the relation between the Helsinki Ida and Norsk Helsinki? What's the relation between the Helsinki Ida and Norsk Helsinki? Norsk Helsinki, uh, the Norwegian Health Network, they are the national service provider for the health sector. They offer lots of uh, uh, national systems, infrastructure, and so on. And uh, Helsinki is owned by Norsk Helsinki. So they own the software. We are consultants. We, we have been consultants for a long time. And, but they, we are part of a greater team inside Norsk Helsinki who are delivering the software. The, so Norsk Helsinki, they, they own it. They, um, and they are also running the, they are the operations team who are running everything. They take re the responsibility for the software. Is that uh, okay? Good. Another question up there? Yeah, uh, regarding to the uh, integration that you have been doing with the health ID, um, it seems quite logical because in the old times, each single, uh, like, bus leg office was doing, like, their own application, and then it makes sense that we're doing an integration now because we didn't have the technology at that time. But if you see, for example, like, nowadays, we have, like, That's a big question. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I believe there are actually two questions. Uh, one is uh, who are approving the various health uh, systems uh, that are used in Norway? But you also, is there any sort of uh, uh, co someone managing the sector? That's the second question, right? Yeah, well, I was wondering if there is anybody who is taking care of all the applications that, that Norway as a country hmm. is making, and that is including, you know, the, the health sector. Yeah. This hmm, hmm. If there are, there are lots of vendors, software vendors in Norway, and there is no overall uh, control of, of who offers. Anyone can offer healthcare systems, but there are some approval processes. But before you can use Health Theater, we, uh, we do, uh, still do for any system who does uh, comp uh, use um, uh, complex uh, functionality, we, we do an approval of the system. We do either a code review or we have a self-service uh, uh, form that you fill out where you guarantee that you are following uh, some security requirements and so on. And uh, there, are, uh, there is also a requirement that uh, the vendor must have uh, this agreement. Uh, there must be a supplier to the, the health net, to the Norwegian health sector. So there is an approval process there as well. So it's not like anyone can offer healthcare systems and get started. But at the same time, the, we have a code of conduct for the IT systems in uh, Norway. And uh, 
the, uh, that code of conduct, uh, for instance, says that you are allowed to do healthcare systems outside of this health network. So it's legal, but to use uh, our, these common national services, you must be pre-approved. But uh, there is nobody who says we need uh, one uh, uh, corona system or, or ten. That's uh, up to the supplier and the market. Yes, over there. We are not allowed to run on the cloud, Shrems yeah. 2, or uh, it's not popular to run on the cloud right mm -hmm. now, so we're running on uh, internal data centers, which the Norwegian HealthNet owns right mm -hmm. now. They're building a private cloud infrastructure, whatever, yeah, you know, that's a term. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, everybody uh, who stores sensitive da data is uh, in the Shrems 2, if you know that. It's a, it was a European... Uh, decision which said that uh, if you store sensitive information in the in the cloud there is a risk that uh, for example uh, an, uh, if it's an American company on it the American state may tell them to deliver this data to them so uh, a lot of people are afraid of using the large cloud mm. vendors right now excuse me if you have plans to go to the cloud, uh, not right now. We are thinking about using the cloud as a fallback, fallback situation, so where we have a read-only co uh, mm -hmm. copy on the cloud, uh, and have fewer redundancy in data centers in addition to mm -hmm. that, but uh, not as a first no. choice. We are running. Uh, we have a lots of redundancy across. Uh, the Norwegian Health Network, they have data centers in Trondheim and in Oslo, and we are running redundant uh, both across the data centers and in uh, several nodes in each data center. So while we are fairly certain that, w fairly resilient, but uh, we're probably good enough for the requirements, but we bel believe that uh, we probably need something more uh, in the longer haul, but not not yet. Up there. How is, how is our si software financed? We have a product owner here. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, it's paid it's paid <laughs> by the membership of uh, the Norwegian uh, Health Network at the moment, and also by uh, financing from the from the eHealth, the directors of eHealth. In they conjunction are with the large national projects yeah. where we get a bit of the money. Mm -hmm. some functional. So they finance uh, new functionality and new cross-cutting uh, requirements, but the ma maintenance and the service itself is part of the membership of the Norwegian Health Network. And that is part of the, re the reason that there is a requirement that you are a member of, uh, uh, m you are a member to use our service. Any more questions? Bring him on. Up. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Go on. Mm. If our service would have been impossible without the Norwegian and national ID? Uh, Not impossible, but no. really difficult. Really difficult. Because then you, you do have to have some way of telling if you have local identities and you want to transport those identities to another party, you have to solve that in some way. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out a way to yeah. do it. Basically building your own then national yeah. thing on the top. So the, uh, there is a common European initiative, the EDAS, who offer a, a standard for national identities across uh, Europe. And uh, the Norwegian providers, they are, are built on that and inside that framework. And that means that it's been quite easy for us to pick up those, ad those identities and reuse them for sharing health information. Now, there, we are working on picking up identities from the regions that are not necessarily based on those EDAS, EDAS identities to allow even simpler data sharing. But that is a work in progress, and we are going to get there, but it takes time. So 
we would not have been where we are today without the national services. The party know, is starting. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah, the party is starting, but we have one more question, I think. No, two more. But Mm. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Lots of talk. The uh, we should do that. We might do that. Uh, yeah. a, a more mm. technical, in-depth uh, would be interesting. But it's there is so much going on. So we were talking about uh, what to mention, what to not to mention, and uh, <laughs> this is a much easier, easier talk to do. <laughs> uh, one more question there. How do we handle versioning of APIs and if it's in use? Uh, our, at the moment, we, there are some 20, 30, 20, about 20 APIs uh, secured by our service. Big APIs, but uh, there aren't that many. So at the moment, we have control. And uh, we are introducing this self-service system where it's up to the owner of the API to handle it themselves, basically. Yep, uh, and uh, that will support versioning as well. Mm. Uh, final question, <laughs> one of our colleagues. So this is, will be a troll question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, uh, no, I'll try to be really nice. I uh, really uh, enjoyed your talk. Uh, could you uh, uh, perhaps say something about uh, our client requirements? Just a, a few words. Not a troll. Uh, our client, <laughs> what are our client requirements? Do you want to say it back? Uh, we do have some strict requirements on how uh, the, um, the applications implement the protocols. They can use a subset, basically. They have to use some parts of the OpenID Connect mm -hmm. OAuth specification parts. We, and some parts they can't use. They have to use uh, a specific flow, authorization code. They have to use some mechanisms, Pixie. Uh, they can't use passwords as uh, client authentication uh, mechanism. They have to use uh, private public key uh, pairs, basically. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, if the, the, the client is uh, doing sensitive stuff, we do a code review. Uh, we we uh, strongly recommend that uh, applications use uh, pre-built libraries, which is uh, approved by the OpenID Connect Foundation. Mm. That's not possible in all cases. Sometimes they have to build their own because they're using a language which doesn't have a good uh, library. Uh, uh, we yeah, request, request objects. Uh, we are building... Uh, we are based, uh, for those of you who were in Dominic's talk, we, there is an upcoming version of OAuth called OAuth 2.1, and we are basically aligned with that, pro that profile, but we are not allowing all the mechanisms. So we are, we are tightening down the protocols to just uh, certain features, but if you support OAuth 2.1, then uh, you are probably good with Helsinki as well. We could uh, do a separate talk about this. Yeah, we could, we could. There's one minute left, so I think uh, we'll wrap up. One, one, oh, okay, one more question. Okay, one more question. <laughs> uh, this is fun. Yeah. You are asking about uh, basically our software development process, and we are part of a larger team inside the Norwegian Health Network. We are we have an operations several operations people, we have uh, testers, we have software developers, and so on, and we are part of that team. We uh, they are always doing monitoring and uh, quality, quality assurance and all that, and that's part of the pro uh, software development process inside the Norwegian Health Network. We are, we're out of time, but uh, let's talk. <laughs> Come talk to us. We are here for the rest of the conference. So let's finish there. Thank you.